Hello. 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 <clears throat> How are you all? Have you had a good conference? Yeah. Are your brains basically melted from lots of hardcore technical content? Yes. So this is not that. This hopefully is a fairly shallow talk, because I'm a fairly shallow person. Um, I'm Mark Rendell. I'm Mark Rendell on Twitter, because I have no imagination. And this is Futurology for Developers. And I'm doing this talk this year because this is the 30th anniversary of my first actual paid job as a software developer. And when I started in 1989, I worked in an office where this was the computer. We had terminals that were attached to this computer, and we all worked on the same computer. And there were eight developers working on this. And it was a Tandon 286. And it had two megabytes of RAM and a 150 megabyte hard disk. And we shared it. And you know that XKCD cartoon of the guys jousting on office chairs and saying compiling? We used to play table tennis for two hours while the build ran. And if you were responsible for the build breaking, you had to stay late to make sure it was working again the following morning. And uh, yes. And this was the chip inside that, uh, that machine. And it ran at 8 megahertz. Not 8 gigahertz, 8 megahertz. It had a single core. It had 134,000 transistors. Uh, and they were one and a half micrometers across. It was a 16-bit ch chip. It could only cope with 16 megabytes of RAM, but if you wanted to buy 16 megabytes of RAM, it would have cost you tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of kroner. Um, and it could do 1.6 million integer operations per second, and it couldn't do floating point operations at all. You could actually buy a, a coprocessor called the Intel 8287, which just did floating point operations, and it was insanely expensive and nobody could afford it. And uh, you're probably familiar with Moore's law, which says the number of transistors in uh, an integrated circuit doubles every two years. Um, it's often sort of the power of computers doubles every two years. And Intel have done their level best to make Moore's law stay true for the last 50, 60 years. And they've done all right up to now, but it's, it's kind of stopped. Um, actually, the chip I want to use as a comparison to today is the Apple A12X. This is the chip that's in the iPad Pro at the moment. And this ha runs at 2.5 gigahertz. It has eight cores, and it has 10 billion transistors inside it. Um, and they are 7 nanometers across. Um, and you know, this thing does five trillion floating point operations per second thanks to its artificial intelligence neural processing unit. Just to give you an idea of that difference from 1.5 micrometers to seven nanometers. So if this was an actual transistor inside an integrated circuit, then this would be shrinking it down to seven nanometers. It is actually still that I did this very carefully. It is now one pixel on my 1080p screen. Um, it's just there. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but I promise you, it is there. Um, and we had two megabytes of RAM. And at the time, that seemed like a lot, because we'd only just got past the thing of who could need more than 640K. The first computer I ever used in my life was a ZX81, and that had 1K of 1,024 bytes of usable memory. And so this was a two megabyte um, SIM, and those things were not cheap. Those were like over 1,000 pounds, over 10,000 kroner. Um, these days, we have 32 gigabyte uh, DIMMs that you can stick in a laptop. You can stick two of these in a laptop and have a laptop with 64 gigabytes of RAM and it runs incredibly fast, and it can transfer insane amounts of memory per second. This is the 150 megabyte disk. This is a five and a quarter inch, full height, SCSI hard disk. And just to give you an idea 
of how big these things were. There you go, for scale. <laughs> okay, it's only a model. <laughs> but yeah, this, these things were big and they were heavy. And before you shut the computer down, you had to issue a Unix command to say, park the disk heads and then shut the computer down. And if you didn't do that and then you moved the computer two feet to the left and turned it back on, your disk would be broken. It's fantastic. These days, Samsung have now got a four terabyte micro SD card, which is equivalently is about that big. And we used to talk to these things using a WISE 50 terminal, which was black and white, 80 by 24 characters. And we used RS-232 cables to communicate with it. You could actually get a laptop. Um, this was a compact uh, portable 286 laptop from 1989. This thing would set you back 6,000 pounds. It weighed 6.4 kilos, and it ran for about three hours on battery. Not really very portable at all. If I could choose a laptop today, I would get this one, the Lenovo ThinkPad X1 Extreme. This is just insane. It's a six core, 4.6 gigahertz CPU, 64 gigabytes of RAM, weighs less than two kilos, runs for 15 hours on battery, and costs two and a half thousand pounds. And this was our printer. Because we didn't have GitHub in those days. We didn't have any way of doing code review where everybody could sit around and just could go through the code. When we did code reviews, we would print it out, which would make this noise. And then we would sit around with pens and highlighters and we would mark up the code on the printer paper in the conference room. And back in 1989, there were things that just didn't exist. Most obviously, the internet didn't exist, which meant no GitHub, no Stack Overflow, no docs.microsoft.com. Um, if you wanted to understand how something worked, you would go to the bookshelves and you would get a ring binder and you would flick through the pages and you would find the page that told you how to exit VI. and then you would steal that page and just keep it on your desk for future reference. <laughs> um, and that was it, we, that, we had VI. It wasn't even Vim in those days, it was VI, and it wasn't VI, it was pronounced VI. Um, and then there were people who would use Emacs, but they were wrong. <laughs> we didn't have Wi-Fi, we had hard uh, cabled networking, and actually we had um, 10 base T token ring networks, and if somebody removed a computer from the network, the whole thing would go down. And if you were the last computer on the network, you had to put a terminator on this weird little T thing. Otherwise, the loop wasn't closed and the network just didn't work. And we didn't have the cloud. So if you wanted a, a new server for running your system, you would have to fill out a, a specification sheet and then that would be faxed to the supplier, and then maybe six months later, if you were very lucky, they would send you a new server. And we didn't have portable mobile devices with touch screens or anything like that. Um, the first instance of anything like that was, of course, the Apple Message Pad, which arrived in 1993. And that 1993 was not a good year for Apple. Actually, the 1990s generally, Apple were kind of struggling. Um, this thing weighed uh, two-thirds of a kilo, and it had four megabytes of memory, and the idea was that it would recognize your handwriting. But if you just wrote your name on that, you could then go and make a cup of coffee, and by the time you came back, it might actually have appeared on the screen. Whereas these days, we have the Apple iPhone XS, which is just fits in your pocket, insane amounts of processing power, insane amounts of memory, always on the internet, all this sort of stuff. We have made a lot of progress over the last 30 years. Things have got faster, things have got smaller, things have got lighter, things have got preciser. Um, manufacturing has got preciser. 
Our programming languages have got preciser. Things have got powerfuler. I'm just making up words now. Um, <laughs> but they have. And while I'm making up words, I might as well go the whole hog. They have got connected. -er. And so what I'm going to try and do in this talk is extrapolate and look at my experience over the last 30 years and use that to try and imagine what the next 30 years are going to be like and the sort of new skills we're going to have to learn and, and how the world's going to change. So, if we extrapolate Moore's law to 2049, then we would have 328 trillion transistors in a single CPU core. That is not going to happen because those transistors would then have to be smaller than atoms. And that probably isn't going to work. Um, I don't think you can make things smaller than atoms unless we actually start making them of electrons and protons and neutrons, and those things are notoriously badly behaved. So we're having to look, and we can't make the processors bigger. People sometimes wonder why we're worrying about cramming them into this tiny little space here. Why don't we just make them bigger? And actually, the reason is the speed of light. Because everything on that transistor has to be able to communicate with everything else on that transistor in the space of a single clock cycle, which is like the 2.5 gigahertz thing. And if you increase the size of the die, then things can't get from one side to the other in a clock cycle without traveling faster than the speed of light and that's not allowed. So we're kind of stuck, and so we've got, there are possibilities with processors. Um, there are new materials which will help us get down to kind of four nanometer and three nanometer, things like silicon germanium, and uh, everyone seems to think that Graphene and carbon nanotubes are going to save us from everything. Um, I have not yet seen anything that can't be improved by putting carbon nanotubes in it. That's going to be awesome. Um, photonic processors, where we actually just use photons to move stuff around. And people are building photonic processors right now. It's just that they're like back to being the size of a washing machine, so that's not particularly useful. Um, organic processors, that's quite interesting. Our brains are insanely powerful computers. We are basically just machines with uh, body to carry ourselves around in and experience the world. And so if we can s learn how to create organic computers just by engineering DNA and RNA and so on, then we could potentially create computers that are as powerful and as fast and as clever as our own brains. And then there's quantum computing which I don't understand at all. Um, if anybody says they do understand quantum computing, then they don't understand quantum computing. Uh, because nobody understands quantum. Um, my favorite statistic about quantum computing, a 64-bit quantum computer, and we haven't actually built one of these yet, but IBM are pretty close, a 64-bit quantum computer um, can hold 18 quintillion, 446 quadrillion, 744 trillion, 73 billion, 709 million, 551,616 values. All those different values from naught to that big number all at the same time. No, you don't understand quantum computing. I don't understand. The best theory they've got about how that actually works is that there are that many parallel universes and there is the same quantum computer in each of those parallel universes, and each one is holding a different value, and then they somehow communicate and collapse, and it comes out, and they all show the same result. Yeah. That is honestly what they think is happening. They're like, every quantum decision creates a new alternate universe. It's nuts. <laughs> so, smaller, faster, cheaper, and also everywhere. Computers are everywhere now. Um, I, preparing this talk, uh, I went onto my Wi-Fi router and I got a list of all the things in my house that are attached to the Wi-Fi. This is not the complete list, but there are eight computers, eight phones and tablets, two Xboxes, a PlayStation, switches, the TV, the televisions, some light bulbs, the doorbell, the washing machine. My Wi-Fi is, it's insane. And more and more things. There's a Raspberry Pi on there somewhere that I'm not sure where it is. It's. <laughs> It's somewhere, it's on, I can't find it. I think it might be in the loft in a box. Of these things, these 
are not actually what you would call a computer. Um, in the sense, you know, they're not like a CPU and memory and like a box that feels like a computer. And these things are not even any kind of computing device. This is like the Internet of Things side of stuff. The wristwatches and the Echo devices and, and um, <clears throat> yeah, no, there are three Kindles. And that's, you know, they're books. Um, actually, this is out of date. There are four Kindles now because I've got a nice new Kindle Oasis. Um, and we never throw any of the old ones away, so they stay in the house and plugged in and connected to the Wi-Fi. Um, and so for us as developers, it's important that we uh, stay current and make sure that we can code for things to run on things that are not computers as you think of them. And it's very easy to get started with this. You can go onto um, the internet and you can buy yourself a Raspberry Pi 3 for uh, exchange rate, what, 300? Krona, roughly, 350 Krona. Um, that is an astonishing, that is so much more powerful than that 286 that I used to work on 30 years ago. It's insane. Um, I've actually got a Raspberry Pi running in the cloud, running a .NET Core website for me, and it costs me $2.99 a month, um, $2.99 a month. And yeah, you can grab that and you can code on it and you can make games on it and you can plug things into it for like um, temperature sensors and cameras and microphones. You can build your own Alexa or Google Home or whatever. Um, and, and it's a pretty powerful machine. If you want something a bit more powerful, you can get the Asus Tinkerboard, which is roughly the same kind of idea, but um, with a much more powerful CPU on it. Um, if you want something less powerful, but much smaller and that will run on a 9 volt battery for a year, you can get yourself a Raspberry Pi Zero W, which has got Wi Fi built in. If you do get one of these, get the W, because the one without the W doesn't have Wi Fi. No, no good. Um, you can also get the NVIDIA Jetson Nano, which is an artificial intelligence processing machine. Um, it's not from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. I keep forgetting to edit that slide. And there's a whole bunch of other ones you can get hummingboards and orange pies and everything. And, and, it's important that we learn to code for these things, partly because computing is becoming something that is just everywhere and uh, not something that we consciously sit and interact with, but something that reacts to us and gives us contextual information and monitors what's going on around us. And this is becoming a much more common use of computing now. And so um, it's, it's a good idea to be on board with that. And it's very, very easy to, to get started with it. The other reason, though, why um, these low-powered computing devices are important is because they're low-powered. And the stuff that we do uses an awful lot of energy. Um, this is the projected use of energy by technology, by ICT, over the next 20 years, up to 2030. And the expected case is that by 2030, 20% of all the global energy usage will be computers of one sort or another. And if you've got a little website um, that doesn't actually hit 10% of the CPU, but it's sitting there running on an Intel Xeon processor with eight gigabytes of RAM somewhere in a data center in Amazon, and you're not using all of that power, then you're just using energy unnecessarily. And so you can help fight climate change and save the environment and hopefully keep the planet alive for another 20 years by maybe switching to ARM servers, uh, get a Raspberry Pi running in a data center somewhere and use less power. But it is very easy to get started with this. .NET Core will run on ARM64 and ARM32. Um, and there's the Core RT project, which is turning into other things. By the time we get to .NET 5, which is the .NET Core after .NET Core 3, don't ask. Um, I have a whole PubConf talk about that. Um, <laughs> But yes, uh, and so there's a great project on GitHub, uh, jsandler18 GitHub IO. By the way, um, there's a website that goes with this talk, which I'll give you the address for at the end, so don't worry about noting down the URLs. There's links to everything. Um, but that's about building an operating system from scratch for Raspberry Pi. And then Alexandra Mutel, who's XOOFX on Twitter, 
um, basically has done that using C Sharp as the development language, so that's fun. Uh, .NET Core 3 includes system.device.gpio, which lets you interact with things plugged into the I.O. ports on Raspberry Pis and other boards. Um, and there is also the Uno Square have the Raspberry I.O. project, which gives you higher level so things that just, it's a temperature namespace or a pollution namespace or a humidity namespace or whatever. So that is my first recommendation, is start learning to run stuff on Raspberry Pi and start using these ARM processors and these small low powered computers, these five volt computers instead of the 165 watt computers um, where you can. Next thing I want to talk about is the stuff that we have now that is kind of at the point where that dot matrix printer and the message pad and that compact laptop were 30 years ago. Because we know we've come from those and then we look at what we've got now and there are things that we've kind of, we're just at that stage with these new technologies. The most obvious one of these at the moment is user interface. And that is changing in a big way. Virtual reality, augmented reality, um, XR as the kind of combined thing for both of those. And, you know, people guess what the future is going to be like, and obviously it's going to be the Oasis, and it doesn't matter that the world's going to hell in a handcart and is going to be 500 degrees Celsius at the North Pole, because we'll all just be hiding in the Oasis and we won't be able to see any of it, because it'll look like this with robot butlers and girls with porcupines on their heads. Um, but where we're at right at the moment is we have things like the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive, and um, those look great and funky. Of course, what's not pictured here is the many, many wires that it takes to attach these things to the insanely expensive computer that's got at least a GTX 1080 graphics card. So to get in on that side of things, you're looking at uh, maybe a 30,000 kroner investment to buy the computer and the headset and everything else. But that is already getting better. If that's like the... Um, the message pad level of, of virtual reality, then we're kind of getting to the Windows Mobile level of virtual reality. Windows Mobile 6 maybe, still styluses, still not um, touch screen exactly, still stabbing at tiny little things and hitting the wrong one. Uh, this is the Samsung Gear VR, which you stick your phone to the front of your face and can experience a limited form of virtual reality. That's pretty good. Um, Oculus made the Oculus Go, which is essentially that, but the phone doesn't come out. Um, and you can pick that up for $99. Um, but I just got one of these. This is the Oculus Quest. Has anyone got a, an Oculus Quest yet? Seriously, get one, and I'm about to explain why. This thing has, um, it's actually a two-year-old phone CPU. It's a Snapdragon 835. Um, but you put this on, there are no wires, you're not connected to anything. You draw a space around yourself and say, this is my safe space. And then if you get too close to the edge, it shows you a grid inside. And you, you're just, that's it. You're in virtual reality. This is like the, cons the handheld console, the, the Nintendo 3DS version of virtual reality. And it is amazingly good. Um, I'm going to show you uh, a game on this. And I swear to God, this game... So the Oculus Quest, I think uh, 4,000 and something kroner, um, completely standalone unit, no computer required, that's it. And you can play this game. If you wanna escape with me, come take my hand. Where basically you are in this dark space and you have two lightsabers and music plays and blocks come towards you and you have to hit the blocks with the lightsabers. This is my new exercise routine. Half an hour of this and I am sweating like a stuck pig and I have had an aerobic workout like you would not believe and it's actually, you know, I know I say it's very easy to put this thing on and there's no setup, but before I play that game, I have to go and put on shorts and like a gym t-shirt. Because if I do it in jeans, that's it. Those jeans are going in the wash now because you're jumping from side to side to avoid those walls and ducking. It's brilliant. I swear, it, that is, 
even if the Oculus Quest just came with that on it, and you couldn't put anything else on, it would still be worth £400. It's brilliant. It's also on the PS4 and the Oculus Rift and the Vive, but it works best on the Quest because there are no wires getting in the way. Okay. So that's virtual reality, and that's, we, you know, you can still see the pixels, and there's still a bit of lag, and it's limited in what it can do. The Quest, it cannot show the same level of graphical quality as the Rift and the Vive and so on. Um, but, but we're getting somewhere. This is like the Windows mobile stage. Microsoft, um, earlier this year, launched the HoloLens 2. This is still very much a commercial um, project. This has got the Snapdragon 850 CPU, which is the one that's kind of designed to run Windows rather than uh, phone operating systems and Android and so forth. It's got a holographic processor unit. Um, it's got custom AI. It's got a much better field of view than the first HoloLens. The first HoloLens had a box kind of here that you could see in, and this one's got a box more like that. So it's gone from 40 degrees to 70 degrees. Um, I suspect that at the point when they want to make this consumer, they'll get it up to 110, which is about here, and that's, you know, that's fine. There's a little bit around the side where things might disappear. Um, that is available now. Um, <laughs> if you've got 4,000 pounds, if you've got like 40,000 kroner. Um, although there's some weird subscription thing, and I think they're opening it up to developers where we could get that for like 1,000 kroner a month or something, um, along with a Microsoft CRM Dynamic subscription. And God knows you need one of those. <laughs> this is the more consumer-focused one. This is the Magic Leap. Um, this was like vaporware for a very long time, and they were demonstrating it with that uh, thing of a, a bunch of school children in a gymnasium, and a whale burst out of the floor and then smashed back down and splashed everybody with water. And then when they actually released it, it was a goldfish in a bowl. But, um, you know, it's, it's got a much smaller field of view, but it's lighter, and um, you can get this, and you can get apps for it, and here's an example of an app for the Magic Leap. This hipster dude with his plaid shirt wandering around his house and just going, I want a television, put a television there. I'm going to watch Cheddar News on my television, which isn't, now I'm walking through my television and into my bedroom, and now I've moved the television and it's following me around and I've got two televisions. And now I'm just, I'm completely comfortable walking around my house with this and making the television follow me everywhere I go. This is completely awesome. I'm living in the future. Look at me. I'm great. You know, I'm taking the piss, but actually, that's pretty awesome. Um, and that's the Cheddar Live News app. If you can afford to get a Magic Leap developer kit and you can get somebody in America to order one for you and then send it to you, or Canada, I think those are the two places you can actually buy the damn thing now, then you can get one and you too can look like this dude. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, maybe around your house when nobody's there and nobody's looking, but you're not going out in those things. But augmented, so virtual reality, I think we're kind of, at, we're starting to make progress through the phases. Um, augmented reality, we are still at the message pad point. But it took 13 years to go from the message pad to the first iPhone. And then it took another 13 years to go from the first iPhone to the things we've got in our pockets now. And you imagine what augmented, what 13 years, or even just five years or 10 years, is going to do to that Magic Leap headset. I'm thinking probably something like this. Certainly, we'll be getting to the point. And the thing is, you sort of go, no, you're being ridiculous. How could you possibly fit all that computing power into a small pair of glasses like that? Well, later this year, in September, you will be able to buy this. This is the Enreal augmented reality headset. It is going to be a consumer device that you plug into your phone, and your phone provides the computing for it, and this will cost 5,000 kroner. You can get that, and that you could probably just about get away with wearing in the park or at the pub. Um, it's, it, they just showed it at um, the E3 Entertainment Expo uh, last week, and apparently it's so good that Magic Leap are suing them now. Um, so yeah, it's, it's obviously a, a nice bit of kit. So we've got that. 
it's getting to the point where it's something. And when we do get to the point where it's like a pair of Oakley shades or, or Ray-Bans that you can just stick on and then go out and it's putting things in the real world, I already have my app idea ready to go. You're going to draw out a route on Google Maps of where you want to run. And then when you go out and start your run, there will be coins and mushrooms just placed along the thing going bing, bing. And, but if you're a Sonic fan, then there'll be an in-app purchase where you can change them into golden rings. And if you bump into anybody, golden rings will fly everywhere. Um, or if you're old like me, then there'll be an add-on where you're just running along um, chomping dots. And if you turn around, there are four colored ghosts chasing you. But you know, this, the world is going to become augmented. And so in the same way that we've got actual devices floating around the place, we need to start thinking about the way that we are presenting data, the way that we are communicating through our user interface, because it's not going to be flat rectangles sat in front of somebody or held in their hand or anything uh, anymore. It's going to be all around them, and it can be anything that you want it to be, and there's got to be a lot of creativity. And CSS, I'm guessing, is not going to be up to the task. So we need to figure that out. Um, the resolution at the moment is not great on these things. It's kind of 1440 lines um, on the latest headsets for virtual reality. This, the Lucy One, is a really expensive and barely functional device. This is for very, very rich people who do a lot of flying, um, and it is just for watching movies on aeroplanes, really. Um, it's bloody expensive, but this thing's screen has 3,000 pixels per inch, which is like three times the current screens. It's using uh, micro LEDs. So Samsung have got their new 8K TVs are using mini LEDs. This is using micro LEDs, and that kind of resolution when you combine it with something like uh, Cheddar, you will actually be able to put 4K screens floating in space. And so I honestly don't think we're even 10 years away from you going in and sitting at a desk. You're still going to have a keyboard, and you're still going to have a mouse, but there won't be monitors. There'll be a headset, and you'll put the headset on, and then you can have as many monitors as you want, and they can be whatever shape you want, and they can be positioned wherever you want, and no one can come and look over your shoulder and see that you're playing the dinosaur jumping game in Chrome when you're supposed to be doing your end-of-week report. Um, you probably saw this when Microsoft announced the original HoloLens. Um, they still haven't actually made this real, but they have actually got Minecraft Earth launching on iOS later this year, where kids can build their Minecraft thing on a table in the house, and then they can save it and go out into the back garden or the real world and dump it full size and then get in and walk around it and interact with their mobs, whatever a mob is. Um, and uh, but it's not just the back garden. This thing is hooked up to Microsoft's Azure Cloud and their location service for augmented reality. So you can go anywhere and dump your Minecraft thing down, and if you make it public, then other people come along with the app, and it's just there. And you can sort of see, I mean, one of the business models of this has got to be for you to be able to reserve space around your offices or Buckingham Palace or whatever to stop people putting penises in it and <laughs> things like that. But yeah, I reckon we're, you know, somewhere 10 to 20 years away from this being reasonable, wearable, lightweight devices that we put on our faces and um, usable display resolutions and proper tracking and everything. So the world is essentially going to become some kind of weird, fucked up arcade. Um, and pop-up ads are going to be a real problem. <laughs> um, this is a little desktop game that you can play with. Uh, it's on the Magic Leap and the HoloLens at the moment. This was made in Unity. Um, and yeah, you just use this device here. Um, this is being recorded off the... Uh, off the output, the mirroring thing, so you can't actually see the person's hands, but there is, he's just pressing those non-existent buttons um, with his fingers or her fingers. Um, so yeah, that's quite fun. Um, this, the people who made the leap motion, the thing that tracks your fingers, this is their idea for what um, virtual reality would be like. And this you can actually make yourself 
um, from components that you can buy in 3D printing and everything. And here, they've just turned the user interface into your hand. And so you interact with your hand and pull things in and out from it and so forth. Um, and you sort of think, OK, so I mean, actually, the concept of the phone, the, the thing that you hold in your hand and interact with, that's, it's quite a good user experience. I quite like that. But the problem is, it's quite big and chunky. And as we have seen this year, making screens that actually fold up is harder than it looks. Samsung and uh, Huawei have both failed at this. Um, but if you've just got a white plastic rectangle and that's all it needs to be, you can fold that up as small as you want. You can scratch the hell out of it. And also, the rectangle can just be the bit that you touch. The screen can go way off in front of it. And yeah. So this is, we are on the verge of, of some very big changes in user experience and mobile devices and so forth. So to be ready for this, you kind of need to understand 3D graphics and modeling. Um, you need to get your head around Z as well as X and Y. You need to get your head around rotations and positioning and GPS and spatial design and start thinking about new interaction models. And the best way, well, what I'm doing is I'm learning Unity. Um, and I'm actually, my daughter is also learning Unity, so I'm doing stuff with her. My son is, um, we're doing a Club Penguin remake with felt tip pen drawings. Um, but Unity works with all of these things. So I can create stuff for the Oculus Quest. I can create stuff for HoloLens, for Magic Leap, for the Nreal it will be uh, available. It's a really fun way to get started. And it is basically just .NET and C Sharp under the covers. Um, so there's a bunch of uh, useful things there. Lots of tutorials. Um, if you're more of a web person, then if you go to aframe.io, that's a kind of web framework for working with um, XR. Um, and immersive-web.github.io. There's lots of stuff going on around this. Um, and if you want to read a good book about this, then if you haven't read Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson, bloody read it, because it's a fantastic book. Slightly dated in some of its ideas about gender and, and that sort of thing, so, you know. Um, but it's, his vision of the future was so good that he is now working for Magic Leap as their kind of um, futurologist chap. So, moving on, manufacturing. At the moment, manufacturing consists of pulling raw materials out of the world and shipping them usually to China, where they go through factories and get turned into things and then shipped back to wherever the, they're being sold um, and, uh, and sold by Amazon and delivered in brown cardboard packages. But this is also changing. The way the factories are actually making stuff is changing because we've got 3D printing now. This was 3D printing. This was the first 3D printer um, 27 years ago in 1992. Um, and this was... This works basically the same way that most 3D printers work today, except this one uh, would cost you $100,000. Um, and it was really, really, really big. And then by... Uh, 2007, um, somebody came up with a RepRap, which is the self-replicating 3D printer. So apart from the metal rods um, and the wooden plates, all the things on this printer could be printed using the printer. So if you knew somebody who had one of these printers, you could say, could you print me the parts so I can make another printer? And they could say yes. Um, and that was 12 years ago. Now, if you go onto Amazon and search for 3D printer, you can pick one of these things up for about 2,000 kroner um, and get the, the spool for it and everything. Um, and most of these are actually just evolutions of that rep wrap. But we're starting to see um, real consumer targeted, real user friendly um, 3D printers are coming up. This one in particular caught my eye. Um, what does that remind you of? in terms of consumer, it's a bloody iMac. Yeah. It's, it's the, the iMac from Apple's resurrection when they became cool again. When you went, I don't like Macs, but I'm buying one of those just to use as an MP3 player in my house, because it has really cool visualizations in iTunes. Um, that, it's only 3,000 kroner. Do you like the way I'm localizing my prices? I think I'm doing really well, thank you. 
<laughs> You're welcome. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's between two and three thousand krona, depending on sort of supply and demand and uh, Chinese tariffs and whatever else. And that's got Wi-Fi. You just turn it on, stick it somewhere in your house, and then go onto your computer and download something from Thingiverse and print it. It's fantastic. Um, this surprised me. I didn't know this was a thing. This is a color 3D printer. So with this, you use special um, material, special filament for it that is white and dyeable, and then you just put ink into it. And as it is printing, it dyes the plastic so it can do full color prints. So if you want to create a 3D printed model of a character from the video game that you're making to learn Unity so that you're ready for the virtual reality revolution, you can do it. You can just send the 3D model across and it'll come out full color. Um, if you're really, really rich, you can get a Form 2. This is a laser resin curing printer. Um, this, so the SLA printing, the, the stereolithographic, it, you can see the pixels. We're at that point where you can still see the pixels. Um, the Form 2 uses a laser to cure resin as the thing is being lifted out of a, a tank of liquid. And this creates really, really polished, smooth, high-resolution prints. Um, that will set you back uh, 5,000, 50,000 kroner if you pay for all the washing and curing boxes and, and everything else. But it produces lovely results. Oh, also... A single bottle of that resin is like thousands and thousands of kroner. So it is a really expensive hobby. But you know, if, you, if you've got the money, it's also great fun. Um, but we got from uh, that noisy thing that we use to print out code for review in our office to a tiny little thing that would produce photos of the quality that previously you would have had to take a film to the chemist and wait a week in 20 years. And so I think 3D printing is going to progress at roughly the same rate. Um, we're already at the point where 3D printing in labs is being used to create gadgets. For example, um, this, uh, and this was actually 10 years ago, um, this was a 3D printer which had multiple materials in it and it could print a functioning remote control. The only thing you had to put in it was the batteries. You could literally hit print, wait probably quite a long time admittedly, come back and put the batteries in, point it at the television and it would work. It printed the integrated circuits and everything. And so we're going to get to the point where you can do this. You can just have raw materials in your inkjet tanks, effectively, and be able to print everything that you need. Um, gadgets, you know, when you're uh, out running and your augmented reality headset flies off your face and you tread on them and you break, they break, you can just go back to your house and hit print and it'll print you another one. Um, God knows how anyone's going to make any money in this world. Maybe we'll go all Star Trek and there won't be any. That would be nice. Um, somebody is already figuring out how to 3D print food. That is a very unpleasant looking piece of jelly on a chunk of glass that has just been produced by a 3D printer. But according to the article, if you stick that in a frying pan for two minutes on each side, it becomes a yummy piece of meat. Yeah. maybe a couple of years, but um, yeah, th but this is, uh, we've got a lot of problems at the moment with raw materials, with manufacturing, with labor conditions in China, um, with logistics. Another large chunk of the global energy consumption is based on shipping raw materials to factories and then shipping finished goods back to where they came from. Um, it may not be that everybody in every house will have their own 3D printer that is capable of printing everything, but it certainly seems possible that there could be like a local shop of some description where you can say, print me one of these and then just pop down an hour later and pick it up. Um, and, you know, um, this is not going to happen in the next 30 years. But, uh, you know, you get to the point of the Star Trek replicator where you can just go, do this and make me food. And while you're making it, make it hot um, by manipulating the, the molecules and the atoms. Another Neil Stevenson book, because 
this guy has just predicted the next 30 years for me. Really, what I'm doing here is I'm just telling you what Neil Stevenson said. Diamond Age. Um, in Diamond Age, um, everything is 3D printed, and he wrote this before 3D printing was really a thing. Um, but everything is made from molecules and from atoms. The reason it's called Diamond Age is because carbon is much more available than silicon, and so if you need something that's transparent and hard, diamond becomes cheaper than glass. And so all the windows are made of diamond. And there are airships that work just by sucking the air out. They don't put anything else in, they just create a vacuum and start floating around. So yes, there's that. Then of course there's artificial intelligence. Is anyone working with artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning, any of that sort of stuff? The thing is, you are. Even if you don't know you are, every time you do that recapture thing and it tells you to identify the traffic lights or the storefronts, you're working with artificial intelligence because what they are doing is getting you to train their fucking model. So please, please, unless you really need to get into the site, that you are trying to get into, if you have the option of mucking about, choose all the other squares, because it will put off the robot apocalypse just for another couple of months. <laughs> but AI has come quite a long way over the last uh, 60, 70 years. Um, Alan Turing proposed the Turing test in 1950. The Turing test says, if you can have a conversation, uh, or two conversations, and you can't tell which one was a computer, then the computer is intelligent. And actually, the Turing test is becoming easier to pass now because people are becoming more stupid. <laughs> Just Twitter, you know. Most of the people I see on Twitter who I'm not actually following would probably fail the Turing test. Um, in 1956, John McCarthy and Minsky um, started the Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT. And back in those days, they had no idea how complicated it was going to be. It was kind of like, well, this is a computer, and our brains are computers, therefore the computer can be as intelligent as us. Um, and so they started working on that and uh, did lots of stuff. But in 1973, the year I was born, there was a report called the Light Hill Report that said artificial intelligence is probably a non-starter, and it's unlikely that we could ever create a computer that could beat a human, uh, that could beat a good player at chess. The 1980s were a total waste of time, which we spent on expert systems and the Prolog programming language, and we made no progress at all. It wasn't until 1997 that Deep Blue by IBM beat the world's best chess player three games out of five or four games out of five. Um, five years after that, we got the first artificially intelligent thing you could just drop in your house and get it to do the hoovering um, that wasn't your mum. And that thing would learn the layout of your house and be able to detect things that were in its way, and when it needed charging, it would take itself back to its charging base and plug itself in and recharge. Um, you have to empty them a lot, though. They're very, very small boxes of rubbish. Um, 2005, Boston Dynamics with their robot dogs and then got acquired by Google. Uh, 2005 was obviously the point where Google decided to drop the whole don't be evil thing and start building military attack dogs. Um, 2011, IBM's Watson computer played Jeopardy and beat the two best Jeopardy players in history. And it was actually, it was listening to the questions, it was looking at the board, reading what was there, it was understanding the, the sorry, it's Jeopardy, it was understanding the answers and then phrasing the question properly and Jeopardy's weird. You know, if, if Jeopardy was actually, oh, we're Jeopardy, we give you the answer and you have to give us the question. Okay, here's the answer, 42. Yeah, I'll, I'll take stupid bloody ideas for quiz shows for $200. Um, 2011 was also Siri. Uh, 2014, we got Amazon Alexa. Um, Alexa is the only one I will allow in my house um, because I know Amazon just want to sell me stuff. I won't have Google Home. I don't know what they're up to. Um, I just, I do not trust. And, and Facebook? Facebook are going to put an always-on device in my house? No, they're not. God. 2014, we got driverless cars started driving around the place, and they've hardly killed anybody so far. Um, just like, what is it, three or four people? Um, 
plus some people who were in them and went, oh, it's a driverless car, I'll have a nap. <laughs> um, so, yes. But uh, Tesla... Um, Elon Musk talks a lot of trash about other driverless cars and, and Tesla are, are going to be better than everybody else. The thing that Tesla have got that the others haven't got is actual cars with the technology inside them out there driving around several hours a day. Tesla have got billions more miles of usable data than Waymo or Uber or anybody else has got. So I do think Tesla are going to get there first. And the cars are doing this. Tesla have acknowledged this. You can opt out of it if you're weird about that sort of thing. Um, and they're not gathering all the data. The car will be told to look out for specific things. So look out for bicycles that are attached to the back of a car and we want to be able to differentiate those from bicycles that have actually got people on them and are being ridden, because obviously you treat those two things differently. If it's attached to the back of a car, you swerve to avoid it, and if it's got a person on it, you swerve to hit them. <laughs> no. Um, Google Assistant came along in 2016, good for them. Um, in, also in 2016, DeepMind came up with AlphaGo. Um, so when Deep Blue beat Kasparov at chess. They said, oh, but you could never win a game of Go. It's too complicated. And then AlphaGo came along and beat the world's best Go player at Go, um, four games out of five. And then in 2017, so AlphaGo, they pre-programmed with all the games of Go they could find records of, and it used that to build a model. AlphaZero in 2017, they just went, these are the rules of Go, just play yourself. And for 24 hours, it played itself, and then they put it up against the Alpha Go thing from the previous year. And I was just joking about the bicycles, honestly. Um, and it beat Alpha Go. This thing is just insane. And all they gave it was the rules. So this is where we are right now, is we have Alpha Zero, we have these machine learning models, deep learning models, tensor processor units, um, neural processor units in our phones, uh, things like the Apple A12X has got the NPU, the Snapdragon 855, the holographic processing unit in the HoloLens. Um, also, field programmable gate arrays are great for artificial intelligence and deep learning models, because you actually rewire the internals of the chip and it can learn stuff really fast. We've also got AI as a service, so you can use Microsoft Cognitive Services or Google Cloud or whatever you want to do. You can create your model and then chuck it up there and it will eat through it in no time at all. Or you can send up an audio file and it will send you back a transcript of that audio file. Um, if I was paying the enough money for PowerPoint and I had a microphone plugged into this, I could be having subtitles appearing on the screen telling you what I'm saying, and it's actually pretty good at that. You could even, I could put a URL up there, you could go to that on your phone, and it would be translating what I'm saying into Norwegian for you while I'm talking. And this is all happening through Microsoft's artificial intelligence cloud services. And IBM Watson is available as a service as well. And you can get SDKs that make this incredibly easy. Has anyone taken a look at the ML.NET library that Microsoft have made? Seriously, download it, have a play with it. It is absolutely brilliant. It's so easy to do things that you just, five years ago, if someone had said, you could do this, and you go, no, that'd be way too complicated. And machine ML.NET just makes it incredibly easy. Um, there's OpenCV and Keras and uh, TensorFlow, um, which you can use from .NET or Python or Java or C++. Um, there's also Mycroft, which is an SDK for creating your own personal assistant, which you can run on a Raspberry Pi, um, which is great fun. And if you are full on tinfoil hat and you won't even have Amazon in your house, then you can get Mycroft and just create your own thing. Um, if you want to get started, if you go to .NET slash ML, that will give you a bunch of links. You can download the NuGet package. You can create your own applications with it. And there's a whole bunch of samples um, available, really, really easy to learn from. That works with .NET Core 2.2, and it's going to get better with .NET Core 3. So the future, the stuff that we haven't got yet, but that it looks like we are going to get over the next uh, 30 years or so. Quantum computing is the obvious one. So we actually have quantum computing. You can go onto websites and write quantum computing code and then pay for some credits and run it on an actual quantum computer that is actually using quantum superpositions and fluctuate and God knows what, multiple universes to run your weird little algorithm. 
Um, and there are three stages that quantum computing's going to go through, and we're currently at the first stage, quantum annealer, um, which is basically useless. This is the can we make this work phase. This is like creating a single transistor. The next phase is the analog quantum computer, and the analog quantum computer will be very useful for calculating things that are quantum. That's why. So you can create a model in an analog quantum computer that is the analog of a real-world thing. And actually, that will be able to do some very useful stuff. That will help us to create more efficient fertilizers, find more efficient ways to produce energy, uh, find more efficient ways to, to deal with food and all that sort of thing. And then we get universal quantum computers, which will basically be able to do everything that current computers can do, but instantly. So. A a universal quantum computer could recalculate the entire Bitcoin blockchain in a second, rendering the entire cryptocurrency world absolutely bloody useless. So if somebody says they're launching a universal quantum computer, sell your Bitcoin, sell your Ether, sell everything, get out. It's about to crash like nobody's business. If you want to get started with quantum computing, Microsoft have actually got a language called QSharp, and you can download it, and there's a plugin for Visual Studio, and you can write quantum code. Um, it's weird. I tried it. As far as I can tell, it's kind of like, do some predictable computing stuff, then pass it through an H gate, then here's a number. Nobody knows why. <laughs> do it again. It's a different number. Yeah, this is useful. <laughs> it's, it's a random number generator. Um, IBM have the IBM Quantum Experience. The links to these are in the website I'll give you at the end, so don't worry too much about the fact that they're incredibly long. But IBM, you can run it on a simulator, and then this is the one where they've got a real quantum computer, and you can put your algorithm in a queue, and then eventually it will get run, and they will send you the results, and you will have written something that ran on a real-life quantum computer. If you want to get a kind of grasp on how this stuff is supposed to work, there is a brilliant book called Computing with Con Quantum Cats by John Gribbin. Very accessible. Um, you go into it not knowing what quantum computing is. You come out at the other end knowing what it is, but not having a faintest idea how it works. Uh, multiple universes, God knows what. Um, the other thing that we're just sort of starting to get into is nanotech. And nanotech um, that kind of combines with 3D printing. 3D printing will become nanotech at some point, and the two things will combine. And that's where you get to the point where you can start printing grains of rice and exciting stuff like that. But current nanotech research, um, we've got nanomaterials, so the carbon nanotubes, remember them? They're fantastic, they can do everything. We've also got nanoparticles, uh, which you can mix in with normal particles to make them more nano. Um, Quantum dots, which if you've got a really expensive television, that's got the QLED thing from Samsung, that's quantum dots. They're doing something to color, to make it more colory. Um, with nano uh, materials in medicine for, for creating medicines that can get where they need to go faster and act more quickly as well. Um, we've got uh, people working on creating DNA and RNA so that you can create molecular machines that just put themselves together. In, so you drop the, the components into a solution and they just form themselves together into tiny little machines. And these machines can be medical use, they can be uh, all sorts of different things you can use them for. Um, we've got top to EUV lithography, which is how we do seven nanometer um, CPUs and how we're going to get down to five nanometer, four, maybe three. Three, I think, is probably the limit. Um, solid state systems where um, the interaction between uh, particles and molecules within a lump of something changes its internal state. So you can just have a lump of crystal that is memory or disk. Uh, I don't know what focused ion beams are. Um, and functional nanotech, I mean, this is the obvious stuff. So everybody knows what anisotropic superparamagnetic materials are. Um, so I won't go into that. Um, <laughs> 
but uh, yeah, molecules that you can use as uh, transistors or as memristors or whatever, molecular motors, which work just using ambient vibration from the atoms and the electrons, that's completely mad. Biomimetics, this is the thing about trying to create organic CPUs based on how our brains work. There's, there's just some amazing stuff going on. Single molecule manipulation, 3D printing with the actual molecules, nanorobotics, robots that are so small you can't see them. That's a fantastic idea, let's build those. Um, programmable matter, also known as computronium. That's, that's like the proper cloud. We can just go, look, it's cloudy, let's run our code. Um, We'll program the water molecules in the cloud to do what we need. Um, it's very easy to get started in nanotech. Um, you need a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and a PhD and then a research position at a good university and then you're sorted. Um, good luck with that. <laughs> so in summary then, um, over the next 30 years, so in 10 years time, the world is going to be hit by the Apophis asteroid and it's going to destroy all life, possibly. There's like a 1% chance of that happening. Um, assuming that doesn't happen, though, by 2029, I think we will have the pervasive augmented reality. I think virtual reality will have been a kind of step along the way, but we will have, um, certainly in our houses and in our offices and at our desks, we will have headsets that we wear that uh, show data around us in new and interesting ways um, and present contextual information. I do think we'll have self-driving vehicles, possibly just lorries in 10 years' time, but lorries that stay in the goddamn slow lane on the freeway and don't overtake at one mile an hour difference up a hill blocking everybody else at 60 miles an hour, sorry, 90 kilometers an hour. Um, we're going to get a lot more automation in manufacturing and farming and logistics and in knowledge work. Um, our jobs are going to start becoming uh, scarcer as things like ReSharper actually become able to understand the I want a CRM system. Um, <laughs> alt, enter, write e-commerce package. Um, so we're going to have to start dealing with the massive job losses that are going to ensue from this. 2039, I think this is the point where we're going to be 3D printing stuff all over the place. There will be no more manufacturing in the sense that we have it now. Um, we'll actually start seeing applications of nanotechnology. We'll have a lot more robots doing stuff. We will have a base on Mars. I really think that is going to happen by, by 20... I, I want to live to see that, and I'm not going to make it much past 2039 because I am not a healthy man. Um, and I think at this point also we're going to start augmenting ourselves and, and replacing bits of ourselves. It's like I've got RSI and my fingers don't bend properly anymore. Um, in 20 years' time, I fully expect to be able to go into a doctor and this hand is just not very good anymore. Can you cut it off and give me a better one? That's going to be awesome. Um, and then by 2049, we'll be living in this modern utopia um, where we take our robot dogs for walk on the end of our extensible arms next to floating um, self-driving vehicles. Um, this is actually Mars, this picture. We've terraformed it at this point. Um, we don't have the concept of money anymore. We don't have the concept of being held hostage because of your mortgage. We can just live lives of leisure and research and the things that we want to do and all looked over by machines of loving grace. <laughs> all the entire planet will be underwater and we'll all be dead. One or the other. Let's try and make it this one though. If you want to find any information about any of the stuff that I've talked about, if any of it piqued your interest, then go to futurology4.dev. There are links to everything on there, and I'm updating it as I update the talk. I hope that was enjoyable. I hope it gave you something that you want to go off and play with. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I will see you next year. Cheers.